first of all, I would like to thank the organizer for uh, giving me the opportunity to present uh, this uh, work. My presentation is based on a paper written together with my supervisor, Professor Cotescu, and Professor Cosmin Hrucha. So I will talk today about scattering of Dirac fermions on Schwarzschild black holes using the partial wave analysis approach. So after presenting briefly the approximative analytical solution of Dirac equation in this geometry, I will apply partial wave analysis to these solutions and after which I define and read the partial amplitudes and cross sections with the help of um, phase shifts and at the end I will uh, perform uh, some, I will give some examples and uh, some physical consequences. Uh, our uh, paper for the moment can be found on this uh, archive server. So, we know that uh, uh, for a manifold with, which has a central symmetry, we can define a central static chart on which we can introduce the usual spherical coordinates. But also on this uh, manifold, we can define local frames. And I will uh, use the local frames given by the so-called Cartesian gauge defined some time ago here. And in this gauge, the line element has this form, and it depends on three unknown functions, w, u, and v. And these functions, we, in the case of uh, Schwarzschild uh, black holes, we will see what are the exact form for uh, these functions. So this, this Cartesian gauge is very useful because it allows us to make the separation of uh, spherical variables in the same way as uh, one is doing in the central problems from flat, from flat uh, space times. So this is the main advantage of this gauge. We note that uh, the Dirac equation, it's, uh, the, f the exact form of the Dirac equation depends on the gauge in which we are working. So the, in our case, the, the gauge has this form, the tetras of the gauge have this rather maybe complicated form. And uh, I already said that the, we can separate the spherical part from the radial one. And this uh, will allow us to write the point-like energy eigen spinors in this way, where phi plus minus are the usual, usual four-component angular spinors from Minkowski space. And we will remain only with the radial problem, which will be in, encapsulated in, a, in the radial equation. And for that, we will have to find the radial wave functions, f plus and f minus. Okay, but so far was only general, so what I've told you before can apply for any curved background. And now let uh, me go to the specific problem that I'm discussing today, namely the Schwarzschild, uh, LM, the Schwarzschild okay, curved background. We all know the Schwarzschild line element, and if we compare the Schwarzschild line element with the form of the line element in Cartesian gauge, we can now read these unknown functions. And these functions are here. The bad news is that uh, now the radial equation that results from, uh, from here has no analytical uh, solution er everywhere in space. And so one uh, is forcing to resort, to resort to numerical methods in order to solve the radial equation, like done in the work of Dolan et al. Or to use some uh, analytical approximation of the equation and to find the analytical solution in uh, some uh, in ex particular regions, for example, at infinity or near the black hole. So, because we are, in, we are uh, because I will talk about partial wave analysis. Yes. 
for scholarship field, yes. Mm, I don't. Yes, but that, the, the um, okay. In in the case uh, of uh, Chandra Seker, uh, you somehow resolve the radial problem, but the spherical one remains. Yes, but you you in in that case, from what I know, you remain with the spherical uh, problem. So, in my case. I, I'm not uh, very familiar with Chandrasekhar formalis because it's very messy, but from what I know, this is the situation. And uh, in this case, you by using this gauge, you solve the angular problem and you remain only with the radial problem. So, f for at, uh, at far, far, far away from the black hole, the radial equation can be solved exactly, and the solutions for the continuum, continuous energy spectrum is uh, expressed in terms of Vita curve M and W functions and has this form where this F plus minus hats are these functions. And we also introduce the Novikov type coordinate X. So we first, int we, we first introduce the Novikov coordinate, then obtain a new radial equation, and then solve this equation and ob obtain this solution. Here I have the some uh, con the okay the normalization constant satisfy these two relations, and uh, the other uh, physical parameters are the different relation between the physical parameters. An uh, observation is that uh, these solutions, F plus and minus, are similar to the solution from the relativistic Coulomb uh, problem of uh, scattering from central potentials. Okay. Now some words about partial wave analysis. We know that at the, if you look uh, at infinity, the form of the energy eigen spinner is, is like this, has a plane wave part plus uh, spherical one, and because, because the spherical one is like in Minkowski, has the spinner is of this type, and it can be shown that the scattering amplitude depends only on two unknown functions, f and g, which also depend only on the angle theta after fixing uh, the geometry in a clever way. So if we determine this f and g, we have solved the problem. So, in a partial wave analysis, it is important to find the so-called phase shifts. And if you find these phase shifts, then you're uh, almost you then you introduce these phase shifts in the given formulas, and you have determined the scattering. We know that um, when uh, in Minkowski space. The solution of the Dirac equation, when you scattering of a potential, can be re can be at infinity can be expressed in this way, where delta k are the phase shifts. So if we can put somehow our solution in this form, then we can read this delta k in our case, and uh, that's it. Okay. Before doing that. I must say that we need to impose this condition, C2 plus equals C2 minus equals zero in the, in the solution, namely basically kill this uh, part. And this is uh, necessary to recover the correct Newtonian limit in the, for, for a large angular momenta. So taking the limit of the solutions, we can re-express them like here. And because we are, we we need f f plus and minus without a hat, and those are simply combination of f plus f minus with a hat. We will see we see that here we have e to the plus e to the minus. So basically, here the combination will be a sine and, and the cosine. 
So in the end, we can express in this form, where besides the phase shift delta k, we have also point-dependent phase shift. But this point-dependent phase shift does not depend on any quantum numbers. So it will play basically no role in the scattering. And uh, the, the phase shifts turn out to be given by this, uh, OK, let's say not so complicated, but complicated relation. And let me uh, say that in the case of uh, Newtonian, we don't have this. We, and we have only gamma functions and here uh, gamma Euler function and here all the pa other parameters. But OK. Now going back to the f and g functions, these functions can be found in any textbook, for example, Landau and Lipschitz. And they can be ex expressed as a decomposition of uh, series for uh, Legendre polynomial, including Legendre, in, in Legendre polynomials. And the scattering, uh, the differential across the differential across uh, section of the scattering is basically the sum of the mod square of the f and g. And these partial amplitudes are given here. And we see that they depend only on the s quantities, which s quantities are related to the phase shifts. So this is uh, one of the main results of uh, our research. Basically, it's an analytical, analytical formula for the phase shifts, and in the end, for the scattering, for the partial, for the differential cross uh, sec section, and also total cross section of integration. I should ma mention that uh, up to now, uh, only numerical results were found uh, in the literature. Okay, but. Now comes the another problem. If we sum this series, we will find that they are divergent with uh, L. However, we can uh, fix this problem by um, defining the mth reduced series according to a method proposed by Yeni et al. Some time, some time ago in the 50s. So what we do is uh, multiply uh, our initial uh, series with a function which is less divergent in the origin this function if we go if we, if, if we put this in here we see that the new function will be less divergent and uh, express the new function in uh, terms of uh, Legendre polynomials with some coefficients and uh, we find, uh, we can see that, we can derive that these new coefficients are uh, given by these recurrence, uh, rec recurrence relations. And these rec recurrence relations are obtained from the recurrence relations satisfied by the, by the Legendre polynomials. OK, if we, uh, we can also calculate the total cross section if we make this integration. And uh, another important quantity is the polarization degree, which is defined uh, here, which means that uh, if the initial beam was unpolarized after the interaction with the black hole, could, could, be become, could become partially polarized. Okay, now results. Here we have the back background scattering, which means scattering around theta equals pi for different speeds of the incoming fermions. We see that at the pi, we have the presence of a rather high maximum, which this maximum is indication for uh, glory scattering on black holes. But uh, we also have uh, uh, oscillations around theta equals pi in all cases. And these uh, oscillations are evidence for uh, spiral or orbiting scattering. Another uh, fact that can be seen from comparing the 
relativistic uh, scattering, okay, the relativistic uh, scattering of fermions with non-relativistic velocities, we see that for non-relativistic velocities, the the okay, the, the value of the scattering is much more big than in the case of uh, relativistic velocities, which means that the scatter which uh, okay we from this we can d deduce that the glory and spiral scattering are important mainly for non relativistic uh, fermions the same conclusions are true for uh, forward scattering which means scattering around theta equals 0 with the observation that at theta equals 0 all the amplitudes are divergent and this divergence has the comes from the fact that uh, our poten gravitational potentials has a 1 over r dependence and this should not be very surprising now if we look at the variation of the scattering with the black hole mass we see that if we fix the energy of the incoming uh, fermion and uh, vary the mass of the black hole, the scattering intensity is increasing both for relativistic and non-relativistic fermions and the oscillations also increase. So we see a strong dependence of the scattering with the black hole mass. Now about some things about uh, polarization. Here we have the polari partial polarization, which I already told you what. Uh, so what we can see from here is that as we increase again the mass of the black hole, the polarization is uh, more and more oscillatory and these uh, very oscillatory uh, pictures or these oscillations ha their uh, presence comes from the oscillations in the scattering uh, on in the differential cross section which I presented before in this case now if we want to see in which direction the spin is aligned with a given direction after the interaction. We make these beautiful polar plots. And uh, if we look, for example, here, there is a scattering in the at, P at 90 degrees direction of the polarization, which means that this situation is very similar with MOT polarization from uh, electrodynamics. Okay, conclusions. We have the right for the first time, analytical formulas for the differential and total cross-section in the case of fermion scattering on black structured black holes. We calculated the polarization degree and its dependence on the mass of the black hole. We have discussed the forward and backward scattering. We have found evidence for glory and spiral scattering. And I have not included here, but can be found in the article, is the derivation of the absorption cross-section, some things about energy dependence of the scattering density, and also what happens when the C2 is different from zero. Some acknowledgement for, and thank you. Questions or comments? If not, let's uh, thank the speaker again.